Uh, before we turn it over to Bill, I do have some things I'd like to uh, to bring to your attention tonight. Uh, and I, I guess I should note that my name is John Geiger. I'll, I'll be your moderator tonight. And again, welcome to Walk in the Woods, Spring Creek Nature Trail and the importance of conservation with Bill Bass. Our program is presented by the Woodland Township Environmental Services Department. And we're really excited that you joined us tonight. I'm going to take just a moment to tell you about some of the programs the Environmental Service Department is offering this fall. Our next online class is called Fall Foodscaping Texas Style. And that's going to be on, on Saturday, October 24th with best-selling author Bree Arthur. We're really excited to have her uh, joining us from, uh, from far away, actually. Um, but she knows a lot about Texas and, uh, and our demands here for landscaping. And she's going to be focusing particularly on how to pair edibles for year-round harvests throughout your, uh, your current landscape. So give you easy planting strategies, um, including creative, uh, creative ideas for deterring animals, keep them out of your munchies. We have a rainscaping for landscape irrigation class online, Saturday, November 7. And rainscaping, if you're not familiar, is a new form of irrigation gaining popularity. It dramatically reduces water use while making your plants healthier. This webinar helps you make best choices for your landscape from several rain catchment methods. And make sure you're storing up your recyclables for our free 3R drive through recycling event, which is being held on Saturday, November 14th at the Woodland Senior High School. So we're accepting alkaline batteries, block styrofoam, oral care products, and disposable razors, uh, textiles in any condition, including rags, snack and drink pouches, and eyeglasses. We also have a secure document shredding available on site, and that comes with a suggested donation of $5 per box of paper or five cans of food. And all of those proceeds benefit the Enfaith Food Bank. Last year, we raised over $1,200 and uh, nearly a ton of food for the food bank. So. Um, so come on out, take advantage of that. And if you want more information on these programs and, uh, uh, and events from the Woodlands Township Environmental Services uh, Department, visit our website. You can just Google Woodlands Township Environmental Services. I'll also put the web address in the chat function tonight. And so uh, mentioning track the uh, chat function, I do want to note that while your audio and video are going to be muted for the duration of the program tonight, we still encourage your questions and comments. You can submit those through the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. And then Bill will address those at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our guest speaker tonight, Bill Bass. Bill is an environmental geographer and photographer focusing on wildlife, nature, and conservation in Texas and the Gulf Coast. Bill lives and works in the Woodlands where he directs the Geospatial Analysis Program at HARC and serves as a board member for Bayou Land Conservancy. Bill finds synergies between his photography and experience as an environmental geographer, allowing him to illustrate and communicate the importance of conservation and environmental issues through imagery. Bill's work has been featured by PBS Nova as well as local publications, and you can view his work at BillBassPhoto.com. So, without further ado, I will turn it over to Bill for tonight's program. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and start the presentation. Is that coming through okay, John? Looks great. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, well, thank you very much for the introduction and inviting me to speak this evening to share my work photographing the Spring Creek Nature Trail. Um, I've started photographing the Spring Creek Nature Trail just over two years ago as the trail was being developed and realized it's really an important story to tell, both in terms of what we have here um, in our own backyard, as well as how it fits into the larger ecosystems of our region. In this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the Spring Creek Greenway, the larger ecosystem that includes the Nature Trail, and I'll discuss some of the changes in landscapes we've seen recently relating to the work I do as an environmental geographer. 
And then I'll share some of my work photographing the trail. You'll get to see a lot of the different areas along the trail. And I hope you find my presentation informative and you'll be eager to get outdoors and explore the trail if you haven't done so already and see what a great asset we have in our community and the region. So first a bit about um, uh, conservation photography, if you're not really familiar with those who, who do conservation photography. Uh, many of us photographers enjoy photographing nature. Uh, nature gives us beautiful photos to share or hang on our walls. We've always, uh, I've always kind of liked this quote from Joel Sartori, the well-known National Geographic photographer and founder of the Photo Art Project. Um, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it kind of hits home as to what one is trying to achieve as a conservation photographer. He says, the typical nature photograph shows a butterfly on a pretty flower. The conservation uh, photograph shows the same thing, but the bulldozer coming at it in the background. Um, in conservation photography, what we really try to do is take the photographs we take in wildlife and nature and landscapes and connect them to an audience. We use those images to get purpose and meaning around a particular subject, many times with an artistic flair to really pull in the viewer and, and make some type of a connection. Uh, some conservation photographers have their roots in other scientific professions where they started, such as biology or botany, geology, or in my case, geography. Uh, they may still practice in those areas as a better way to better share their work and communicate issues or the importance of places. But for me, as a practicing environmental geographer, I see the importance of ecosystems like what we have in our region, and I see a lot of change in the data that I work with on a regular basis. So my photography allows me to use imagery to communicate that importance and highlight issues with the hopes that others will also share my enthusiasm and desire to be involved in protecting what we have in our region and our community. For many non-Houstonians, when they think of Houston and surrounding communities, they think of a concrete jungle, endless roads, shopping centers, billboards blocking out the sky. And we have quite a bit of that in our urban areas and along our major transportation corridors. But I grew up down in Clear Lake area and got to experience Galveston Bay and the Gulf Coast as a kid sailing and fishing and exploring coastal areas, boating with my family up and down the intercoastal waterways. That's how I got to experience our Gulf Coast. And although our region and the Texas Gulf Coast has a tremendous amount of industry that is a major economic driver, we also have a great deal of unique and ecologically important areas as well. This creates a challenge to find that balance. There are many organizations involved in conservation of these areas because they know the importance from a natural ecosystem perspective, but also as systems that provide services to help protect us from events like storm surge and improving our water quality. In this photo, you can see a picture I took early in the morning on West Bay on the southern part of Galveston Island near the San Luis Pass. One of the best kept secrets in our region is the Spring Creek Greenway. At roughly 30 miles and 12,000 acres, it's the longest contiguous urban forested greenway in America. Conservation uh, efforts began in the mid 1970s and continue today. At one time, it was at risk of being overdeveloped, but we can thank a few people and organizations that had the foresight to see its value. In the mid 1970s, Harris County Judge John Lindsay and Judy Overly Bell worked to acquire, donated, and purchased properties on the Harris County side based on new floodplain regulations and guidelines. In the early 2000s, Montgomery County Commissioner Ed Chance signed an agreement to permanently set aside land with Bayou Land Conservancy to mitigate against developments of the creek's floodway and floodplain. Throughout the years, conservation efforts have been aided by private donors and landowners, such as Rice University, Mission Development, the Williams Development Corporation, Hughes Development, and what was once Humble Oil. This area has a rich, Native American history and artifacts can be seen in the Jesse Jones Nature Center. If you've never been there, I really suggest you try to go once things open and return to some sense of normal. It's really incredible to see some of the, uh, some of the history around this area. Here you can see a map of the Greenway and just how far it stretches from the east near Tomball all the way to the west near Highway 59. In fact, if you're out on the Spring Creek Greenway, you might be seeing a tree the Native Americans and Spanish and French explorers experienced hundreds of years ago. In many places around our country, old growth has been removed and replaced by newer species, sometimes non-native species. On the Spring Creek Greenway, you have the opportunity to see native vegetation as it was hundreds of years ago. Here's a photo that I took recently along a riparian area along the Spring Creek Greenway early in the morning last fall. You really get to see some beautiful uh, sights if you go out particular times of day. We've been lucky last year with a great fall 
And uh, hopefully this year, maybe fall will be the same and uh, really provides a great opportunity to take pictures and just go out and experience natural areas. The Spring Creek Greenway provides critical bottomland forest and wetland habitat for species like gray foxes, bobcats, bald eagles, a variety of coastal birds, beavers, and century-old bald cypress trees. In this photo is a picture I took of an American alligator along the Spring Creek Greenway. Millions of birds of more than 200 species stop over to rest and refuel in the Houston region each year as part of their migration patterns. Some travel as much as 600 miles nonstop in a flight that takes more than 15 hours. When they arrive, they're exhausted, hungry, thirsty, and need habitat to rest and refuel for the remainder of their migration. These ecosystems that we have along our coastal systems, as well as areas like the Spring Creek Greenway, provide those habitats for them. I like to use the example that if you were doing a marathon or an Ironman, and after you finished your race of several hours, there was no water, no food, no place to sit, and there was no one to take you home and you had to run home. So if you can imagine what it's like for these birds that make these long haul journeys round trip and to have these ecosystems is really important. In this photo, um, the bird in the foreground is a great egret and it's um, in a wetland area and the white ibis are feeding in the background. So it's not uncommon, even though we're kind of inland, to see many of these coastal bird species all the way up in the woodlands area. Hey, Bill. I yes. hate to interrupt right now, uh -huh. but uh, we were not able to become co-hosts, so I'm going to ask that you, um, I'm going to reclaim the host so I can see if there's anybody waiting. Sure. And then I have, some, I have a message for everyone who is participating because of that uh, fact that Bill and I are not co-hosting. I will need you to submit your questions uh, via email, and I put that in the message there in the chat function. So uh, if you look there in the chat function, you'll see my email is jgeiger, letter J, G-E-I-G-E-R, at the Woodlands Township tx dot gov. So just shoot me an email and I will collect those, uh, those questions that way. Okay, back to you, Bill. Okay, great. Here's another photo of um, uh, uh, white ibis um, in, in a wetland area. Um, birds like white ibis are a little bit different than some of your larger um, coastal birds like herons and, and great egrets. White ibis are the type of bird that they like shallow ponds and lakes. Uh, they constantly all day long are just skimming off the bottom looking for really small little you know uh, critters and so forth and um, you know whereas your, your great egrets and your herons are typically you'll see them fishing for fish or other other items, lizards and frogs, and even snakes in the wetland area. So it's uh, really, uh, you know, quite a, quite a great opportunity just to go out and watch them, you know, and their behavior in these areas. So briefly, what I want to talk about a little bit in context of conservation and the importance of these areas is some of the work that I've been involved in as an environmental geographer, looking at what's happening with our landscapes in our region. Um, and this would really hopefully bring on the importance of conservation efforts. Here's a map of the core of our region, and you can see the major rivers and water bodies. As you can see, many of our bayous and waterways drain through the region to Galveston Bay. In the upper left, you can see an outline of Spring Creek Watershed in the purple, of which Spring Creek Greenway and the Spring Creek Nature Trail are part. If you're not familiar with how watershed works, basically think of it as when you have rainfall or runoff that enters these areas, they're going to drain through a major water body. In this case, it would be Spring Creek. When you look at changes in the landscape over time and the loss of natural areas, um, what we look at here is a map of what we call impervious cover. Basically concrete is what you can think about. And the earliest year we have this data is 2001 from the US Geologic Society. And uh, USGS basically produces this data set every few years. And in the pink, you can see the impervious cover area and the Spring Creek watershed is in the, in the purple outline. This was in 2001. And if we fast forward to 2016, you can see the change in growth between 2001 and 2016. Most notably, the change we see is to the west and north and, and northwest. But you also see quite a bit of infill development that's occurring in areas that are already considered to be developed. 
If we look at what they call developed areas, and the earliest data we have for this is 1996, and the very light gray you see on this map, this is developed areas in 1996. We fast forward to 2016, you can see the increase in the development. If we go in a little closer and look at the Spring Creek Greenway, again, looking at the impervious cover in 2001, you can see the difference between 2001 and 2016. Same with development in 1996, developed areas are in the light gray. with developed areas in 2016. And looking at forested and wetland areas, the change isn't always that apparent when you look at a large region like Houston. You have to sometimes look a little closer to visually see those changes. Removal of forests and wetlands sometimes come in small increments that add up, and a few acres here and there can have a very large impact overall to ecosystems and the services they provide in helping to mitigate flooding and protect water quality. Here are forested areas in the light green in 1996. And here is what they look like in 2016. Changes in wetlands are sometimes even more subtle, but nonetheless just as important. Many wetlands that are removed are small pocket areas that may visually be hard to discern on a map. They might even be less than an acre in size, but they still add up to having big impacts. Here are the wetland areas in 1996 shown in orange and in 2016. When we look at this data on a graph, you can see changes for impervious surfaces, developed areas, forested, and wetland areas for the eight county areas, which is Harris County and the surrounding counties. Since 2001, there's been a 30% increase in impervious cover, and since 1996, there's been a 32% increase in development areas, as well as a loss of 22% of forested and wetland areas combined. Losses in forested areas and wetlands can have significant impact on a region's ability to absorb rainfall and mitigate flooding and protect water quality. When you consider the storing capacity of a wetland in terms of an acre foot of water and the ability of a mature tree to absorb 100 gallons of water per day, green infrastructure, as we call it in conservation, to mitigate against flooding is as important as ever. This green infrastructure also works to help improve water quality for our region and the health of Galveston Bay, of which many depend upon for their livelihood as fishermen and oystermen. When you look at this graph, you can see the total number of acres lost. And if you calculate those acres by an acre foot in terms of carrying what we call carrying capacity in gallons, or the fact that a mature tree can store 100 gallons a day, and if you can get an statistics about how many trees on average there are per acre, those numbers really start to add up. The impacts of natural areas are really a global concern. It's not just in our area or other major metropolitan areas experiencing growth. In this graph, you see how biodiversity has decreased over time worldwide. Today, conservation efforts are more important than ever, and conservation really begins in your own backyard. Big iconic places like the Amazon get the big press, and they are significant. But the smaller, lesser known places, many in our own backyard, are just as important, and they're places that we can really do something about on a day-to-day -day basis. They give us green spaces and a place to relax close to home, and they promote biodiversity in our own region. Places like the Spring Creek Greenway and Nature Trail give us those opportunities. So the Spring Creek Nature Trail um, in society today, it's really important because, as everybody knows, we have a lot of technology. We see, uh, especially with young people, um, a rise in anxiety and depression is on the rise. Um, People really need to have access to nature and outdoor places that allow them to uh, rejuvenate, and that's as important as ever. Projects like the Spring Creek Nature Trail not only help with conserving habitats and ecosystems, but they give people access to places to relax and restore. In a recent study, after a green outdoor walk, 92% of participants felt less depressed, 80%, 86% less tense, 81% less angry, 80% less fatigued, 79% less confused, and 56% more vigorous. Here's a map of the Spring Creek Nature Trail. The 14-mile natural surface trail was built for the purpose of allowing people to become immersed in nature. There's a variety of partners contributing to this project, and the list continues to grow. They include some of the major partners as Harris County Flood Control District, REI, 
the Greater Houston Off-Road Biking Association, or GORBA, Repsol Foundation, Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Smith Foundation, Harris County Precinct 4, as well as Montgomery County Precinct 3, the Williams Township, and Hughes Development. There are four major trail access points, Creekside West Park on the far western part of the trail. There is Rob Fleming Rec Center, which is uh, some of you might remember as being the old YMCA on the southern part of the trail in the middle. And then there's the Flint Ridge George Mitchell Preserve access through the uh, George Mitchell Preserve off Flint Ridge. And then there's the Montgomery County Preserve on the far eastern part of the trail. A downloadable version of this map can be obtained from Bayou, the Bayou Land Conservancy website shown on the bottom of the slide. Uh, they are, uh, Bayou Land Conservancy is the steward for the trail and works in partnership with local governments and private landowners to maintain the trail. Markers along the trail allow you to scan the QR code symbol. Uh, the Woodlands Township worked very hard with uh, Bayou Land Conservancy to create these trail post markers. Uh, you, you wouldn't think you know, a trail post marker would be very difficult, but there's actually a real science behind putting these together, giving people useful information. You can scan the QR code and a map will pull up and show you where you are on the trail. Uh, you can also download a free app called the Travel Stories app uh, for a guided tour along a couple of different sections of the trail. Uh, Travel Stories is an app that's used um, nationwide at various different uh, iconic places. And so we're very fortunate to be able to have funding and support from the Union Pacific to put that together and give a little bit added um, extra um, uh, perk to experiencing the trail. The trail offers opportunities for hikers, trail runners, nature lovers, birders, and bikers. The lack of motorized vehicles makes for a tranquil and immersive experience in nature. Here you see a typical view of what many sections of the trail look like. It's, it's rather wide in most places. It's 10 feet wide. Um, the trail crews have made extra effort to, uh, when we cut the trail, to clear vegetation so that even a cyclist who's standing up on their pedals uh, would not hit uh, overhanging branches. So it's very open. Um, it's uh, kind of a, a groomed natural service trail. It's not extremely technical at all. Um, that you like you might get with some mountain biking trails where you have lots of rocks and obstacles and, and things like that. Um, in certain parts of the trail, we've actually put down um, a, uh, a grid that actually helps prevent rutting uh, during when, when the trail might get a little bit soft or muddy. Uh, and so that's a, that's a really big help. Um, birding, there's, there's great opportunities all around the trail for birding. I'll talk a little bit more about that and show some pictures of what you might see out there on the trail a little bit later in my presentation. Uh, hiking and um, you know, trail running, uh, always great experiences. Um, you know, it's a good, nice, soft, um, soft ground to run on. Um, I know a lot of runners um, are concerned about you know, what they run on and, and the impacts on their bodies. And, and um, uh, the trail really offers a really nice surface uh, to be able to go out on. The trail was largely built by volunteers in partnership with local government and private landowners. And again, it's not open to motorized vehicles. So those volunteers um, are really critical to the, to the success of this trail. Um, since the trail opened in June of 2018, volunteers have put in over 3,000 hours. Uh, these are, you know, purely volunteers. These are not paid uh, trail crews. Um, these are people that are part of a trail crew. They, they get out there pretty much every week. Uh, we have a trail crew that um, um, uh, gets out there every Wednesday morning. Um, if, if you're interested in wanting to get out and do outdoors work and you want to uh, get involved, um, you can find out more on the Bayou Land Conservancy website and, and uh, reach out to them to figure out who to contact about becoming involved with the trail crew. But here there's a picture um, of a couple trail crew members working on one of the many bridges along the trail. Um, they regularly work out there and you know really I encourage you if you're ever out on the trail and you see um, these, these uh, men and women out there on the trail, a lot of times they'll have a, a shirt on that says trail crew like this gentleman, uh, please say thank you because they make this trail possible. The western part of the trail has 
a lot of uh, ample opportunities for birding and just enjoying the wide open spaces. Um, this section of the trail begins at the western end off of uh, Dr. Anschneider Drive, which is a small drive just off Creekside Forest Drive. And uh, there are several parking spaces back there that you can park in. And you can do about a two and a half to three mile loop around the lakes that are back there on the western part of the trail. Um, uh, in this picture, the upper left corner is, is one of the, the largest of the lakes. Uh, this was actually taken after a very, very heavy rain. So a lot of times they're not this full. Uh, many times the lakes are, are much, uh, much less full and, and you see a little bit more vegetation than water. Um, the other, the video that you see in the upper right is a, is a great egret that was uh, up there kind of pruning its feathers one day. The bottom left is typically what you'll see on a, a section of the trail when you get into more wooded sections where there was a bridge. Um, again, you can kind of see a very natural path, wide, uh, you know, clear, clearing of the brush, you know, high up, and um, just a very tranquil place to go out and, and sit and just take a walk and enjoy the outdoors. The easternmost part of the trail begins at the Montgomery County Preserve, just off Goody Road. If you're familiar with where the Recycle Center is and, and the baseball fields, uh, this entrance is just across the street from there from where the parking lot is. Um, you can easily park there and, and um, you know, go for a walk down the trail from this perspective. It's a little bit different. Um, you might, you know, a lot more, wo lot more woods and a lot more shaded than, than doing uh, the trail in the western part around the lakes, which is more open. Um, but that's what's great about the trail. There's really something for everyone with, in terms of what they're really interested in, in experiencing. One of the ecological features you'll see along the trail in many different locations are these natural wetland areas. Um, these offer natural retention benefits to help with flood mitigation, as well as filtering water to improve water quality. They also offer critical habitat to a variety of species. Um, here we see uh, a wetland area with some tall, tall wetland grasses. Uh, you'll see lots of different species, uh, you know, around these wetland, you know, birds looking for different types of things. You'll see large bullfrogs, um, you know, just a lot of different uh, types of uh, um, uh, species around there. It's not uncommon to occasionally see an alligator sometimes, uh, small, um, you know, maybe a few feet long, uh, nothing like giant crocodiles like you would see in other parts of the world. These wetlands, sometimes you'll actually see what looks kind of like an oil slick on the top of the water. And although this, in these, in these watery areas, it can be pollutants, it could be some runoff coming from a nearby um, commercial or residential area. A lot of times what they might be is actually just um, uh, microbes breaking down plant material below the surface of the wetland. And in this photo, what looks like raindrops on the surface here were actually just small bubbles that are breaking the surface and coming up from the bottom uh, of the wetland area. So uh, that's a really good uh, possibility that this is just a natural process at work. Uh, but that's kind of what the purposes of, of these wetlands are, is they're really critical to helping us with our water quality and, and providing these habitats. You know, the, wet, the wetlands and natural retention, as I mentioned before, and this is a video I took um, after a really heavy rain. This is on the western part of the trail um, where we had um, um, uh, basically a lot of rainfall coming into the, um, uh, coming into the area. Um, it was, um, uh, you know, filling up these lakes uh, quite a bit. Um, they, um, um, you know, they, they really act as a natural retention uh, type area. Um, you know, this is water that otherwise uh, you would probably see running off downstream, um, you know, potentially flooding a downstream community. Um, so that's one of the important parts of these natural green spaces is that uh, they really help with slowing down the water uh, that we have and um, uh, making sure that uh, that water doesn't, uh, you know, go down and, and flood people's homes. Um, you know, downstream or other types of properties. So that, that's a really critical process that they, that they offer. So I briefly mentioned earlier that last fall, we had a really incredible experience out on the trail. We went out and 
I believe it was kind of late November and, you know, with the temperature variations we had and hot and cold and back and forth, you know, we ended up, um, and some of you may have seen that as well in the area, but we ended up with a really nice uh, set of fall color. And, you know, you don't have to be in Texas long to know that fall color is rare in a fleeting scene. You know, we don't typically get that iconic fall color like you might see in the Northeast and other parts of the country. So uh, you never quite know when you're going to get it or how much you're going to get or how long it will last. But um, we were really treated to some um, great opportunities. So um, definitely getting on the trail when you start to see the leaves turn, even in your own neighborhood, that's a good sign. You might start to see some really good fall color out there um, uh, on the trail. This is a photo of uh, some of our trail crew and board members and uh, Bayou Lincoln Service uh, uh, employees just out on the trail last fall for a hike. You can see the really nice fall color. This was um, this is kind of what the the area around the lakes on the western part look like. Um, this is uh, you can kind of see it's uh, pretty level ground and very short kind of compacted grass. Um, it's nothing really um, difficult terrain or, or anything like that. And uh, there was a really good picture of a great egret uh, with the fall color that we had uh, last year. This was taken on the pond in the very back of the, of the, of the lakes. There's really uh, three different lakes on the western part of the trail there that the trail kind of winds around. And this is the, the lake on the farthest back, which all the lakes really have really good opportunity for watching a lot of different birds. There's some other interesting things in the trail as well. Um, uh, might want to call them somewhat man-made or uh, uh, type features. Um, this is um, an area on the trail we call China Hill. And it's one of those sections along the western part of the trail, um, just, uh, just to the east of the lakes. And it kind of has an interesting story that when we were building the trail and kind of cutting it through and excavating and, and doing everything, we came across these really large deposits of mid 1950s dining China. And we weren't really quite certain how they got there. We had a lot of interesting theories as to who put them there and why. But I think what we really ended up deciding was that at some point in time, someone may have been cleaning out old restaurants in the Houston area or the area. And, and um, you know, some of these areas you'll be walking through and you'll see barbed wire fences still just running right through the middle of a tree because uh, it may have been used for some ranching at some point in time. And uh, so you might find all kinds of interesting things out there, but these China, there's not very many pieces of this left. It's been picked over quite a bit, but every once in a while, when you go along China Hill, you might be able to find a piece or two that are, that are still sitting out there. If you're in the geocaching, um, you know, this isn't like an official activity that, that we really kind of sponsor or organize, but a lot of people, if, if you're familiar with geocaching, where people create these little, you know, caches that can be simply just a, you know, a, like an ammo box that's waterproof and you put a log book inside it and you sign it when you find it and you kind of navigate to different ones and, and locate them using your GPS. So this is a really creative one that someone created on the trail. They actually built this and used an old, old tree bark and built it into an old tree where the the, hut, the, the middle of the tree was all hollowed out. All that was left was kind of the, the, the out, outer parts of the tree. So you never quite know what you might find when you're out there on the trail. Perhaps my favorite place on the trail is, is the beaver pond. Um, uh, this area, uh, if you're looking at the map, it's, it's right there by what's called Bob's, Bob's Boardwalk. Um, it's just to the um, uh, west of, of Kirkendall. Um, and beavers are the engineers in nature and they provide a very viable service to our ecosystems. Um, and the ponds they have also provide a very viable service. So just as you hear about trees and forests pulling carbon from the atmosphere and sequestering that carbon uh, in the tree and in the ground, beaver ponds are really good at locking up that carbon in the buried sediment that's, that's in those ponds. And the beaver ponds also help with the runoff and, and flood mitigation in some areas. Um, you know, there is actually a, a beaver lodge that's out, uh, that's out there by the pond. You can actually 
Um, you know, we've got active beavers out there. You don't see them too much during the day. They're very kind of nocturnal, early, early morning, late in the evening, but you kind of see evidence of them. Periodically, you may see them putting some new mud on top of their lodge and, and evidence that they've had been there at work. Um, although beavers are not currently at risk of extinction, it's estimated that at one time, 60 million to 400 million beavers uh, swam in North America's rivers and ponds. Um, a long time ago when trappers were really heavy and, and trapping beavers for their pelts, um, uh, they, you know, they greatly um, uh, reduced those numbers by the turn of the 20th century. And today it's estimated that their numbers are rebounded to approximately about 15 million. So out there on the trail, if you're into doing nature photography, you just never quite know what you might come across. Um, and sometimes when you're trying to get a picture, nature actually cooperates with you more than you can expect. Um, this is a flock of black-bellied whistling ducks on the beaver pond. Um, they uh, sometimes like to go to the larger lakes on the western part of the trail, but they really particularly like the beaver pond. Um, if you've ever seen a flock of these, these ducks, you would know that they're, they're quite loud. Um, they make kind of a loud whistling noise. They irritate one another. They fight over food. It's a very chaotic scene a lot of times when they're around one another. Um, and that's kind of how this was unfolding that, this particular day. And then all of a sudden, they all decide to line up on this fallen tree and quiet down for just a minute. And well, with the exception of the one in the middle that kept its back to me, um, but uh, other than that, you know, a couple minutes later after I took this picture, they're all back at it again, scattered and quacking at one another and fighting over food. So um, there's some really great uh, photographic opportunities if you're into photographing nature and landscapes out there on the trail. So one of the nice features of the beaver pond is that we have a complete uh, full loop around the pond now. And we, you know, like to thank the outdoor apparel company, REI, who is instrumental in helping us to add a small bridge that traverses a creek uh, on this loop. And uh, they not only helped us with, um, you know, funding the bridge, but also, um, um, you know, helping us build the bridge. And we've got other sponsors that have been very hands-on in helping us. And, uh, um, and so the volunteers and the sponsors we have on, on this trail is what really makes it possible. And I really like the slogan, uh, you know, the slogan of, their, of the REI, um, you know, a life outdoors is a life well lived. And here's another vantage point of the beaver pond. So, um, you know, throughout the day, if you go out in the mornings, afternoon, evenings, um, you know, the reflections on the water change a lot. Um, you just get different colors, you get different reflections. Um, uh, it's really a great opportunity to, if you're into, you know, wanting to take photographs. And this is just within just a few minutes. Of, these two photos are just a few within a few minutes of one another. You can see how much difference there is in them, and and uh, uh, how the light can change. So one of the unique features of the trail are the bridges. And um, when I'm out on the trail, the most common assumption I hear from people um, is that oh, the the county or the state parks built all these bridges. And um, you know, there that's really the furthest from the truth you can get. It's there's more than 25 bridges on the trail. Uh, they were built by a team of volunteers with the support of the Woodlands Township. Um, and these are not flimsy structures. They are well built and well engineered. And a couple of them are almost 30 feet long. Uh, this is a photograph of East Bridge uh, near the George Mitchell Preserve just off Flint Ridge. The bridges are all engraved with names. Um, some of the bridges are just named for their location. Uh, and with a, a date for when they were when they were built. Um, other bridges um, and boardwalks we have are named for uh, volunteers or people who have really been involved in, in helping the nature trail a reality. This is a photo of Peter's Path on the eastern part of the trail near the Montgomery County Preserve. So one of the biggest bridges we have is Caney's Crossing. And uh, this was constructed on the trail a couple years ago. Um, and um, over the past 12 months alone, the Bayou Langan Service Trail Crew volunteers have put in over 1,600 hours maintaining and improving the trail. Um, this is a picture of um, several people involved with the building of Caney's Crossing. Um, and um, 
This is uh, one of our trail stewards and uh, trail crew member and leader, John Stacy. He worked, he's working on a bridge on the nature trail here. He's installing a plank engraved with the name of a supporter on the trail. And that's something new that IU Lane Conservancy just started is um, uh, people can make a donation and, and get a variety of different styles of planks um, from something very small to a full plank, um, you know, and uh, put on one of the bridges on the trail. This is an idea of kind of what's underneath some of these bridges. Um, here's um, volunteers building Caney's Crossing. Uh, you can see these beams are, are very heavy beams, uh, several hundred pounds. Uh, they're not, they're not um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're very sturdy. Um, rebar being driven in to secure them. Uh, all the bridges have a cable usually attached to uh, some, some type of a tree very close by in case we have a massive flood and, and if something became dislodged, we could probably winch the bridge back into place. Each bridge is given a lot of thought and design and attention to detail. And um, you know, once the basic infrastructure is put in place, um, there's, there's quite a bit of time just kind of putting the, the fit and finish on the bridge. So to give you an idea of what goes into the construction of one of these bridges, uh, I'm going to start a video here. It's going to run about four minutes that Bayou Lane Conservancy produced. Um, Suzanne Simpson, who's with Bayou Lane Conservancy, uh, she took some video and time lapse that I shot, as well as some photos and video that she, she took during the construction period. And she put this all into a really great brief video. And I'm going to pause my presentation and start this video. Um, the volume may come through differently on different people's computers. So if it's too loud, just turn down your volume. If it's not loud enough, try to turn it up. Um, if for some reason your computer is just, if it's not coming through with the volume very good, I'll make sure to give um, John the link to this video. It's out there on YouTube and um, you can watch it in your spare time as well. So um, uh, we'll go ahead and start the video here. building a bridge and we're hauling in all of our wood supplies for the bridge that's going over Caney's Crossing that will connect the lakeside for the Spring Creek Nature Trail. So we're using a couple of ATVs to haul in all of our supplies. In fact, the stringers that we're using, we have about three of them, they're 600 pounds each. So we're, we've just hauled in the first one and that was successful, which is good. A lot of hairpin turns to go through here and uh, we're going to be heading back to bring in the other two and the rest of the supplies that we have. Kenny's Crossing is about 26 feet. That's the length of the Springer. But of course, we'll, you know, we'll have the footers on each side and it will extend a little bit further on each side to make sure that we can have full access for bikers and hikers. While it might be warm and humid out here today, it's, it's a good time. We are, we're in a shaded area. We'll have it completed, so there'll be uh, more opportunity for the people that are coming out in the fall, and uh, what better time to do it. We, we began the work uh, last year during the same time period, and um, it was a successful uh, stretch of work that we did. He's big footers over to the other side of that big creek. So what we're going to do is put boards down on the far side of the bank, hook a cable to this big giant piece of timber, drag it down into the creek where it'll hit the boards and it'll pull it up at an angle to the other side. That's how we get the 600 pound boards across the creek. Lane Conservancy Trail Crew is a group of volunteers that have come together from a wide variety of backgrounds and cumulatively they've put in over 2,500 hours of volunteer service into making the Spring Creek Nature Trail a reality. Well, uh, I first uh, was approached by my son who is a very avid outdoors person here in the woodlands and he said hey dad you want to uh, go through the ambassador program and I said sure and so we embarked upon that and it was a really an interesting experience. And then I kept hearing about what uh, 
people refer to as the geezer squad, which is basically, uh, I guess, older guys and gals that uh, decide to volunteer. It sounded really interesting because I enjoy getting out in physical activity, and that led me to uh, a Wednesday morning session every week with uh, these guys coming out and building bridges and clearing paths, and it's just fantastic experience because there's so much enjoyment and fulfillment of seeing the path and a, a, a trail or build a bridge and, that you were involved in and it gives you a sense of ownership in the community plus we're providing great opportunities for the people who live here. My brother, my older brother, has been a long time volunteer and a couple of friends that I worked with uh, were telling me about their volunteer experience and so I decided that that's something that I wanted to do to give back. Caney's Crossing isn't the only bridge that we've had to build on the Spring Creek Nature Trail. In fact, we've had 18 structures that have been put in to uh, increase access to hikers and bikers. But at 26 feet long, Caney's Crossing is one of the largest and it's been a pretty epic bridge build. We're hoping to finish it today. Okay, so I hope that uh, that audio came through for everybody. Um, but it, if for some reason you had some uh, technical problems, uh, we'll make sure that uh, we get you the link to that so you can watch it again or, or share it with anybody else that you might want to share it with. Um, that, that's a really great video because it really shows you what goes into building these bridges. And um, um, although we're not building as many bridges as we were in the beginning, you know, there's always you never know, there might be another opportunity if you're a part of the trail crew to be a part of another bridge build or rebuilding a bridge or improving a bridge. So um, there's, that's a really great experience if you like to get outdoors. Now the trail really offers a lot of opportunities, as I mentioned before, for birders, uh, nature photography, or just some peaceful observation. Um, this was a photo I took um, earlier this spring. Uh, we had a flock of Canadian geese visiting early in the spring. Uh, we've also had other species like the, the large white pelicans that migrate uh, from the north, um, as well as uh, large wood storks um, this past spring that were on one of the larger lakes on the western part of the trail. Um, you get a lot of these birds are coming through on their annual migrations um, in the you know, late winters and early springs, and uh, really provides a great opportunity to see something that isn't always in our area year round. Uh, this is a photo of uh, the white ibis feeding in shallow water on the lakes on the western part and um, I really like these birds because they have kind of this goofy look on their face um, and and um, they're quite interesting they're they're kind of curious about you um, uh, you can only get so close but uh, you know all day long they just kind of wade in these shallow areas and and uh, you know nibble on things in the bottom of the of the lake Early mornings on the ponds and lakes make for really great photo opportunities on the trail, uh, especially in the fall and the spring. A lot of times you'll get kind of an early morning fog that just kind of sits on top of the water and it really not adds a really nice element to the landscape. Um, it's just uh, really, you know, you get, uh, if there's not a lot of wind, you just get real crystal clear glass-like water surfaces uh, for great reflections. Um, these are snowy egrets. Uh, that were on, on the lake. Uh, ducks, we have all, all kinds of ducks, um, you know, very common mallard ducks are out there, uh, the whistling ducks I showed earlier. Um, there's, um, uh, there's been other types of duck species as well, so you just never really know uh, which bird species you might see on the lake. Uh, this is a little blue heron feeding in a wetland area. Uh, this is a juvenile, they start out all white and then uh, later on, you'll see them turn into these really just all blue, really brilliant colors. You know, they're just solid blue. 
Um, they're really pretty birds. Um, they're, and they're really interesting to watch and, and the behavior. This is a great egret. Uh, if you're into, you know, wanting to try to do your bird photography and when you're doing bird photography, one of the first things every bird photographer tries to do is they've got to get that bird in flight. And uh, there's lots of opportunities out there on the lakes to come out and, and try to get those shots you're trying to practice and, and get with your photography. There's a lot of other things too, uh, just when you're walking around the trails, um, you know, other than birds, um, you know, really, uh, you know, all types of different uh, uh, flora and fauna. You know, here's early morning, uh, there's a spider web with some morning dew on it that really made for a great uh, opportunity to take a photo. Um, this is a uh, yellow garden spider. Um, this, they look really vicious, but they're really, they're not, they're not harmful to us. Um, they're, uh, you know, unless you're an insect, it's really not a problem. Um, but you can see all kinds of interesting species when you're walking around. And, and, and that's the thing is when you're out there going for a hike on the trail, um, you know, kind of slow down and take your time because you might be walking right by something really interesting. You might see these in your own yard around the woodlands. These are blue-tailed skinks. They're pretty common. Um, in our areas and flower beds, but you'll see them on the forest floor. They like really moist kind of damp places. And one of the questions I get by people a lot is, you know, they, they come across these really large sandy areas on the trail. There's, there's actually one of these uh, over near the Bob's Boardwalk area on, on that part of the trail. And um, what you're seeing here actually is a leaf cutter ant, leaf, uh, leaf cutter ant colony. And, um, you know, they're, they're scurrying about and, and leaf cutter ants are really like ecosystem engineers. Um, they construct these massive nests, which they uh, import the vegetation uh, into the nest and they feed a fungus and, and you know, they, they feed to a fungus and they cultivate that as their main food source. And these nests, even though on the surface, you know, they may be like 10 square feet on the surface or so, uh, they may go down 20 feet and they may have a thousand different entrance holes and uh, total it might occupy up to 4,500 square feet. Um, leaf cutter ants are really interesting because they can, they can strip a, a, the foliage off a tree in 24 hours. Um, you might have seen some of the iconic pictures of the ant carrying the little leaf. Uh, you'll, you'll see these with these leaf cutter ants as they kind of bring things into their, into their nest. Uh, some other vegetation, uh, beautyberry. Um, this is a native plant. Um, the leaves are actually a uh, natural insect repellent. Uh, repellent. Um, you can kind of take the leaves and crush them up and, and a lot of times, sometimes I'll go out and I'll, I'll think, oh, I forgot my bug spray, you know, and, you know, I, and so I'll, I'll find one of these beauty berries pretty quick and just take, take the leaves, crush them up and rub them on my arms or my neck or whatever and I really don't have a problem with bugs. Um, the berries um, people have used them to make wine and jelly. They don't taste really good just off the vine. They're not sweet or anything. So there's definitely an art to, to creating some good wine or, or jelly with, with beauty berries, but there's lots of different recipes out there. Uh, here's a blue mist flower uh, with a honeybee. Um, when you're out there with these wildflowers, you'll see a lot of, uh, you know, wild honeybees um, that are, um, you know, nesting in trees or other types of crevices and and uh, so there, there's, there's a lot of different, uh, um, you know, uh, different types of species and things all a part of this ecosystem. There's a variety of woodpeckers you'll see on the trail. Um, here's a red billy woodpecker, um, a downy woodpecker. They're pretty common. Uh, you'll also see the, uh, the pileated woodpecker uh, with its iconic red head. Um, if you're walking along sections of the trail and you see any kind of tall dead trees with holes in them, Kind of pause and stop for a second there's a good chance you might come across a, a little woodpecker haven and and they're nesting in those areas so there's really good uh, really good opportunities to see these types of different birds and then also just a variety of different songbirds particularly in the springtime when you're walk, walking along the trail a lot of the bushes particularly there's a lot of vegetation on the western part of the trail around the lakes and all the songbirds just really like to make their nest in those in those low growth dense vegetations If you're kind of a naturalist and into exploring different types of fungi species, there's really no shortage of opportunities, uh, especially in the wooded portions of the trail where it's darker and, and damper. Uh, fungi are a really important part of the ecosystem. Uh, they recycle the nutrients and they help to transfer 
uh, nutrients between trees via their extensive mycelium networks. Uh, today, scientists are just starting to really uncover some very interesting capabilities of fungi and how they benefit the ecosystems. This is a picture of a fungi that's just growing on the side of an old, uh, old oak tree that's completely white with the fungus. And there's also some really interesting arrangements you can come across on the forest floor. Um, what you see kind of building up off the ground is, is what they call the fruit. And you know, below or, or inside the tree is where you just have these miles and miles of fungal networks interconnecting the different trees and the vegetation in kind of a symbiotic type relationship. So in the woodlands, um, we're probably all familiar with a couple of different bald eagle nests that we've seen around the area over in Hughes Landing, and there's some other ones back by Bear Branch uh, Reservoir. Um, but lately out on the trail, we've been starting to see some bald eagles on the western part of the lakes. Um, this past spring, um, there was a couple out on a tree on the middle island on the lake. Um, and so there, and you, know, you see them flying over uh, high up. And um, so that's gonna be really interesting to see if maybe we might eventually see another nest being built out there on the trail someday. Uh, this is a video I took um, of the uh, of the bald eagle on that particular day. You can see it. Uh, it was it was a good you know uh, a couple hundred yards away when I was filming this and up in the tree. Uh, the day before there were actually two of them out there on this the same branch actually. Um, so uh, this really tall pine tree in the middle of the uh, of the lake. So I'd like to wrap up my presentation and conclude by, you know, kind of offering up some ideas on what you can do to help conservation and protect these important ecosystems. Um, you know, first, you can support land conservation organizations and the efforts in your region. Uh, if you like to get outdoors, uh, most if not all these organizations have ample opportunity to get involved and meet people. Many of the organizations have committees and groups that focus on community outreach, education and policy. It's not just all outdoors uh, work on the trail or, or, in these, or in these areas. There's plenty of opportunities to get involved in other ways. Um, you can help with trash cleanup efforts in our community. Um, every year for Earth Day, I know the Woodlands has a coordinated effort. Other communities do as well. Um, you know, every plastic bag, bottle, or other item you pick up is really one less item in our waterways and our natural areas. And um, you know, just remember, just like they, the quote was in the movie Finding Nemo, all drains do lead to the ocean. And um, so finally, um, you know, consider your landscaping and gardening methods as well. Um, switching to organic products um, for widespread application have a tremendous help with our water quality and protecting our natural areas, the habitats and the species that are there. Um, if you are forced to use some chemical-based products because you have a tough issue with chinch bugs or something like that, um, you know, do so sparingly. Don't, don't use them in a broad application um, um, and, and uh, broad kind of, you know, broad, broadly use them. Use them kind of more in targeted areas and um, uh, try to stick to the more organic methods, um, you know, for your broad, broad applications. So if you'd like to see more of my work or follow me on social media and see the images I've shared as well as uh, many more of the, of the items I have on my website. Um, I've got some different photo essays and um, my Spring Creek Nature Trail project is on my website as well. Um, yeah, I typically post updates to my projects as I'm, that I'm working on with others in the conservation space. Um, you can contact me via the connect menu on my website. Um, and uh, you know, for all of y'all attending, if you like some of your website, if you are looking for some stock images or prints or something, um, um, I've created a promo code for y'all to use. It's just um, uh, Woods Woods 20 off, and it's 20 off 20 percent off everything you buy. No limit, no number. Use as many times as you want through December 31st. And I really hope you found my presentation informative, and you leave today with an appreciation for what we have in our own backyard, and perhaps share this information with others and get involved. It's really communities being involved and volunteers helping that are the foundation for land trust and other organizations involved in conservation efforts in our region. Um, I'd like to leave you with just a couple of my favorite quotes as they relate to conservation. The first is by Aldo Leopold, who's an American ecologist, 
forester, conservation, environmentalist. Um, before he saw the light, he was actually, you know, quite a big hunter and trapper. And he's best known for his, his book, The Sand County Almanac, which if you've never read, is, is a great read. Um, the second is um, from whom we probably all know from our history classes. And, um, you know, he was not only uh, President of the United States, but he was also um, uh, a conservation, uh, you know, conservationist and naturalist. Uh, he was instrumental in expanding our national parks at a time when land was wanted for private development for only those who could afford to visit places that we have today, like Yellowstone and Yosemite. Um, and again, if you'd like to see more of my work, you can visit my website at billbassphoto.com uh, or follow me on social media, um, connect with me. Um, and uh, if you have any questions you know, at, beyond this presentation, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be glad to, uh, uh, to, to um, point you in the right direction. And thank you again for your time and I hope to see you outdoors. Hey Bill, we, we do have uh, a few questions that came through. Okay. And um, if, again, if folks want to submit a question, they can, uh, they can send that via email and that email is there in the, in the chat column. So first question we got was, uh, what is the alligator population along the Spring Creek Nature Trail? The population, I don't think I can really answer specifically what the alligator population would be. Uh, it's probably better for a wildlife biologist. Um, and I don't really know if we would really have a number for that actually. Um, How about you know, one thing about alligators, um, you know, they actually move around quite a bit. Um, they'll, you know, after big floods, you might see them pop up here or there in different ponds or, or waterway areas. Um, during their mating season, they'll, they'll, they'll travel across land uh, quite, a, quite a distance. Um, so they're, they're, they can be quite mobile. Um, and so it's kind of hard to pinpoint that number down. But now we got another one on, uh, on critters. Are there any endangered species present? Endangered species. Um, you know, the list kind of changes. I mean, we have you know, we have ones that have been recently taken off the endangered species list. Um, um, but, you know, you have, you have things like the bald eagle. Um, um, you know, we have some of the, some of the uh, other species we have out there that you really don't see at all anymore. Uh, you, don't, you don't see um, uh, mountain lions anymore in our area. Um, I know we get reports and the township gets reports occasionally, occasionally of a mountain lion, but it's highly unlikely we have any of those in our area or our bears. Um, typically, typically what you'll see if you do come across things and, and you're really kind of lucky if you do see them, coyotes and bobcats and gray foxes, um, you know, those, those are very shy animals. They really don't, they really don't want to be around you. They, if they come across you, they're very easy to kind of, if you are work, if you are scared, you can kind of make a lot of noise and they'll run away. But a lot of times you don't even see them if they're near you. They just, they scatter off and, and you don't see them at all, so. Okay, I've got one more. It's actually uh, from me. I, I appreciate you noting what we can do to help maintain mm -hmm. our area's water quality. Thanks for that. And so how is the water quality Long Spring Creek, and what are, what are the major impairments right now? Yeah, um, you know, one of the biggest ones is just your, um, that's a result of the fertilizer runoff, right? And um, if you're interested in trying to get information on current water quality for the different water bodies in our area, um, you know, um, Houston Galveston Area Council has a, has a program that actually does a lot of that water quality monitoring for all the different um, water bodies um, in the region. And um, they have some maps that show where there's impairments, what they're impaired for, whether that be bacteria or other things like, you know, um, uh, nitrogen and so forth. I mean, in our area, our biggest culprit, I mean, you know, bacteria is a concern because pet waste mainly, um, you know, and, and there's a big, always a big movement around, you know, pick up after your pets in your own backyard, as well as if you walk them in, in public spaces. Um, you know, um, 
um, you know, fecal matter from pets is a big contributor to bacteria problems in, in certain streams and lakes. Um, but really, um, the use of uh, chemical fertilizers is, is a really big impact too um, in our area. So as much as you can do to try to reduce your dependency on large amounts of chemical fertilizer and, and only really reserve those for um, areas where you have to spot treat or deal with a very specific small problem in some place versus just broad based application that that can be a big help to helping with our water quality great so pick up after your pet and go organic that's right <laughs> well bill i want to thank you very much for your uh for your presentation tonight um, stunning pictures and and really good information and i want to remind folks that this uh program was recorded it'll be made available to you uh, we'll send out an email to that effect for to all the registrants. Uh, if you want to, to watch it again or share it, um, you're certainly welcome to. Great. And, well, thank you very much. I mm -hmm. uh, enjoyed sharing this. Um, uh, this, is, this project is far from over. Uh, there's other aspects I'm starting to work on with the project. We're doing some work to um, try to get some, um, uh, putting up what we call tram camera traps to kind of look at some different uh, species that we see in the area. Uh, we're really kind of hoping to have uh, some other information to share in the future um, and uh, hopefully we might have something to come back and, and, and have a di little bit different presentation and share that at some point. Well, we'd be excited to see it and thank you so much for all your efforts out there. Great. Well, thank you very much. Real treasure. I appreciate yes, the stewards of it. Well, good night everyone and thanks for joining us.